I would invite you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, which we will come to shortly after a few introductory thoughts. That normally means I've got a 45-minute introduction and we'll have a three-minute sermon. Uh, No, not at all. Over the next three weeks, um, we shall be considering three critical Three critical subjects as um, I've put some notes on the back of the newsletter so you can follow along in this. And there'll be three critical subjects, which in and of themselves are astounding sort of standalone subjects of really the utmost importance to, to any and all Christians. And while it's not my intention to present an in-depth study on each or any of these three subjects, um, I do want to do to have and present a biblically focused and practical consideration of them. And these three three messages shall serve the dual purpose of preparing us for the upcoming Revealing Revelation series, which I am looking forward to very much, and I'm sure you are also, uh, which will begin at the first Sunday of February. So as well as heightening our awareness as a church of God's design for our lives and this particular ministry. Today's message is God's vision for his church. God's vision for his church. I'm humoured as you browse the internet how many people are doing what's called casting visions. Good grief. Um, Well, you should be very thankful this bean doesn't cast visions. (laughs) What should interest us, however, is what's God's vision because it's his church and surely if he's the creator and the designer of his church, surely, surely the sovereign, infinitely wise and knowledgeable and powerful God, surely he must know what he wants for his church. And that's what we're going to consider in brief today. Next Sunday, we'll consider how to consistently interpret the Bible. So it'll probably just be me and Joe next week. Uh, (laughs) And the emphasis on that message is not so much how to interpret the Bible, but to how to be consistent in how you interpret the Bible. And then thirdly, at the end of this month, on the 27th, we will consider God, Israel, and the future. We're going to bite the pill of controversy. And that is just fine. God, Israel, and the future. God knows his own mind. And God knows his chosen people. And God knows the future. So there should be no problem. Unless God's not the God he says he is. And we know that's not true. So we're going to let him take a give us a snapshot of of that. So these three messages will also serve as a a declaration of what this ministry teaches and where we stand as believers and as a church in the larger scheme of things. So foundational to the, the design of the church is that it is to be the place where God's vision for his people is realised. You'll remember when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15, he, he said to Timothy, "You so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So here's just a few obvious facts from that verse. The church is where people should be able to go for God's certainties, for God's insights into life, for God's eternal perspective on reality. God's answers to our questions and his remedies for the messes we get ourselves into are and should be found in the safety of the church environment. In other words, the church, Paul says, is the place where God's unchanging absolutes are found. The Bible calls this truth. And we live in a society that has become so disillusioned about all things absolute that the only thing they say is absolute is that there is absolutely no absolutes. What a load of nonsense. Well, you can rest assured, beloved, that God is absolutely certain about what he knows and thinks and believes and does. And so we, the church is the place where people can come to discover that. The church is to be the one constant in this ever-changing world where truth is upheld and maintained. 
You see, when the church fails to see itself as the the pillar and the foundation of truth, Solomon's words come true from Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Again, just a few quick observations from that as we move towards Ephesians chapter 4. While this Proverbs 29.18 is amongst the more misquoted verses of the Bible, it actually has profound importance for us. Notice the relationship there between prophetic vision and self-control, restraint. They are inseparable. Prophetic vision and personal self-restraint are inseparable. When prophetic vision is absent... Humanity abandons self-control and restraint. Why? Because everyone does what is right in their own eyes. You get that right out of Judges 17.6. The implications of this is far-reaching. People become their own authoritative experts. I, I laugh. I often come home and laugh and joke and moan and groan at Joe. Sorry, not about Joe, but at Joe. About customers who come in to tell me how to fix their car. Because they've been to Google. <laughs> and you've done five minutes of YouTube training. And your 40 years of experience means nothing, but I just can't do it. So I'm going to tell you how to do it, Mr. Mechanic. And I'm going, Really? Well, this ain't the guy to do that because I'm not a YouTube mechanic. (laughs) But you see, the principle is the same. When it comes to the absolute spiritual and moral certainties of God and his design for the world and his design for the church, when we abandon God's vision for the church, we become our own self-authoritative people. You see, that's because desire becomes the compelling motivation instead of truth. And this allows sin to take over in both disbelief, wrong belief, and wrong living. Now, you would expect Solomon's response to be something like this. Well, bring on more prophetic visions. Surely, if mankind's going haywire, what we need is more prophetic visions. And that's what the whole charismatic movement is revolving around, the ever-progressing, ever-changing, ever-mutating perspective of what visions are in the church. But no, Solomon doesn't do that. What does he say? He says, blessed is he who keeps the law. Blessed is he who keeps the law. He says, the existing written law of God is literally God's existing prophetic vision. The law is where God is on display and accessible by everyone. You see, the fact is, when God's people avoid, neglect, or reject God's written prophetic vision in preference for the man-centered, man-focused, self-generating illusions, spiritual restraint is cast off, and you end up in the mess that we see in the world and the church today. We don't need more, I would contend, prophetic visions. I would propose to you this morning we need to agree with Solomon. What we need is to get back to the law of God and to establish our lives firmly rooted and grounded in what God has put in written format as being his prophetic vision for the church. You see, church is not the place where truth or theology are avoided in order to prevent conflict. (laughs) We've proven that for nine years. Church is not the place where absolutes are rationalised away to create an environment of social tolerance of all beliefs and lifestyles. Church is not to become an amoral subculture of religion. No, God says that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, both in the singular format. There are not multiple truths, there are not multiple pillars, and there are not multiple foundations for the church. 
God says there is only one, and that is the written, living, authoritative word of God, penned by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and able to transform lives into agreement with the absolute certainty and truth of the word that the Holy Spirit penned. You see, the certainty for God's people is this. God has a vision for his church. He has a design. He has a plan. And he has desires. And he has a purpose. And he has truth for the church. And nowhere is this seen in scripture more clearly than in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 16. I invite you to turn there if you are not already there. And we'll read it together and then we'll sort of just very quickly unpack it and uh, learn just some of the lessons there for us. And the Apostle Paul writes in verse 11, and he gave, speaking about Christ here, and Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we will all grow up and every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint in, in, with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. The first thing I want to draw to your attention there is that Jesus Christ gave gifts to the church. It's right there in the very first part of verse 11. I want you to notice that Christ is a gift giver. In fact, he's a gift giver by nature, just as his heavenly Father, God, is a gift giver by nature. And Christ gives those things which man cannot assimilate or mimic. In other words, Christ gives what mankind cannot do for himself. In fact, he gives what mankind does not even desire for himself. Therefore, it's important to note the specific things Christ has for the church, which we otherwise would have no access to. And I say, I say we are to take note of these gifts because it's remarkable, remarkable how easy it is us, for us to forget the significance of the specific truths in this passage. Now, we believe that Jesus Christ is the second person in the Trinity, don't we? You should all be going, yes, yes. If God gives the church a gift, surely the church should sit up and say, we, we need to understand this gift. We need to recognize this gift. We need to realize the purpose for which the gift has been given. And that's why it is so important that we understand that this whole passage is talking about specific gifts in the plural tense that Christ has given as a gift to the church congregations for purposes. And we'll discover those purposes as we progress. Secondly, the gifts are a little bit different to what we'd expect. The gift is not money. It's not land. It's not property. In the text here, the gifts are men given to people. You see that in verse 11. He, Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, shepherds or pastors, and teachers. Now, apostles and prophets were unique to the New Testament era and passed away with the death of the apostle John following his exile to the island of Patmos. And I'll tell you just a little tidbit on the side. As you read the New Testament, you will notice the absence of something. No apostle or no prophet was ever replaced. They were a one-time gift only. 
You never, ever read about them in the New Testament. When they died, they got replaced. You remember when uh, Judas went out and committed suicide? He was replaced so that the um, 12 disciples could be fulfilled. Matthias was brought in. The Apostle Paul was one who was abnormally born, and Christ brought him in. And so you only have these 13. You never, ever read of them being replaced. So, however... Today, we still have evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And evangelists, well, they're those specifically gifted at winning sinners to faith in Christ as Lord and repentance of sin. Evangelists, and my purpose is not to go into a lot of detail this morning, evangelists are those who just can't control themselves. They're out there winning the lost for Christ. They're not out there trying to make unchurched people churched. They're out there trying to get sinners to repent and turn to Christ alone, to the cross of Calvary, and to realize that is the center of human history, and that's where we are born again, regenerated in Christ. That is the job of an evangelist. job of an evangelist then stretches into discipling those people to go and do the same again. However, pastors and teachers, and and the way the the Greek is constructed here in Ephesians 4, it's best to understand that the the same man here is being spoken of with the dual ability to shepherd God's people by his ability to instruct. And so the reality is God blends variations of giftedness, skills, and talents into a broad spectrum of personality types to suit all the different times, cultures, and locations that he places these gifted men into throughout history. Thirdly, the prime purpose for the gifts. Now get down to the, the more practical stuff. In verse 12, it is to equip God's people for works of service. Now you'll notice there the specific group of people in the church he addresses. It is to equip who? God's people. Well, that means all of us. None of us are exempt. There is no exceptions. There's no rules. There's no out clause. There's no you never signed the contract so you're not on board. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this passage says God has given you gifts of evangelists and pastor teachers, which is inclusive of elders, by the way, um, for the purpose of equipping you. Now, equipping is an interesting word because it, it, it has no one specific application. What it is, it's a training process where resources from elsewhere, it's a good picture of mercy actually, resources from elsewhere are taken and put into your life through the teaching pastors and elders and evangelists so that you would have the tools necessary to do what God wants you to do. And as I say that, I realise there's a little voice somewhere back here says, but I don't know what I want to do. Well, that's why God gave us pastors, teachers, elders, and evangelists, so that you can know what God wants you to do. Beloved, the reality is what you and I want to do is of secondary importance. I know that's a shock. And I know that's countercultural. And I know that cuts against everything out there in the world today. God is interested in what you want, but not primarily, only secondarily. What he wants best of all for you is right from Ephesians chapter 1 in the first five verses is that you should be the expression of the fulfillment of his will and his pleasure in your life. Now once you've satisfied God and put a smile on his face, I suspect you won't be too interested in about what you want. Um, Although it's not completely removed. I don't want to come across as being completely heartless and calloused. Uh, God is interested in what we want. But primarily it's to equip us as his people to give us the resources that are needed to do what he wants. We live in an age where because we are so multi-choice oriented in our thinking, I was talking to Fred about this earlier, I was shaving this morning and thinking to myself, what was it like in the New Testament church if you had a bit of a tiff with someone? You couldn't just run off to another church because there was only one church in each town. Oh, man. (laughs) What would you do? Um, So you had to work through things. The problem is today we have a minimum of 110 choices in this city alone. 
And so what people think is, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to go down the road. Oh, they got a bit more that I like. And after about six months or a year, they think, oh, that's not quite pushing all my buttons. There is this place down the road that, oh, I think I'd be happier there. I'm much more comfortable. And, and so it goes on and on. And that's why statistically the average person changes church every two years. Why? Because the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And God's saying, but hang on. I want you to do what I want you to do. When do I come into the equation? But that's not the mindset of today's people, is it? So, elders, shepherds, pastors, evangelists, and you need to understand evangelism includes all that discipleship work going on, the discipleship ministry, is there to prepare us and equip us and give us the resources to help us in doing the works of of service. Now, this is not social reform, and it's not believers making church people out of unchurched people. It's, it's for works of service. It's for doing work in service to God. And we need to be very clear on that. One, one of the things I remember many years ago, when our kids were little, um, we had been living elsewhere, and we moved Location and through circumstances, we end up going back to a church that we used to attend many years earlier. And one of the things that struck me on the first day when we uh, came back to this church was how many of the original people were still there. And that really impressed me. I thought, these guys have got stickability. That's great. And I really admire that. And I often pray that God gives me an unnatural degree of spiritual stickability. And so we need to be workers with stickability. I've had the misfortune of employing staff at different times that they get halfway through a job and they get bored with it or it's too hard. They become disgruntled and they walk up to me and say, I'm not doing that anymore. I've had enough. Really? So obviously you don't want to be employed. Oh, no, I didn't say that. I just don't want to do that. Well, it doesn't work that way. And so it is in the household of God. We are to be workers for God. I can see another employer down there smiling. <laughs> it happens. But you know, it happens in church life too. We need to realise that we are workers. You say, I don't see myself as a worker. That's irrelevant. God sees you as a worker. You say, I don't feel like I'm a worker. That's irrelevant because God is going to equip you. He has put all the resources in place to give you everything needed so that you can actually be a consistent, faithful worker in his service. Now that gives us enormous freedom. Because then as you are walking with the Lord and you become aware of areas that need attention, need serving, need working, however you want to state it, you can then have the freedom to focus your abilities and giftedness into that. So you'll notice that a working church will be a building church. A lazy or self-centered church will be a stagnant and complaining church. This is, this is not uh, a group of people marked by the use of personal pronouns like I, me, mine, and my. This is a church that's rather got the uh, use of words like we, our, and us as we serve God together and work together for his service and for his glory. Next, number four, is the scope of God's purpose for his gifts. So he's got a purpose. He wants to equip. He wants us to use our, equipment, our equippedness, if there's any such word, our equipping, to be productive and working in his service. And he says there in the latter part of verse 12, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now you'll notice there, that's an all-inclusive statement, all of us. Now I want you to realise something, people, and it's true of me and it's true of each one of you. Either my life is actively building you up or it's actively diminishing you. And you know what's true? You're all looking at me, and you're doing the same. You are either actively enriching my Christian life, or you are actively diminishing my spiritual walk with the Lord. That's a big responsibility for all of us. But it's true. He doesn't say, 
He does not say that only the elders are responsible for building you up. No, we are all responsible. It has always bewildered me why pastoral ministry can be such a lonely life. Why? Because the church as a whole, and I'm not referring to you, by the way, I'm just generalising, the church as a whole often fails to take responsibility for building each other up. Mutuality in ministry, in life. And so this speaks to a church-wide expectation that everyone should be growing in their faith. It speaks to the fact that God never desires a church to be perpetually uh, remaining young and weak in their faith. It tells us that the Holy Spirit energized body building is always in motion, moving forwards, moving upwards. As in all building projects, it's to in, be intentional and purposeful. When builders build a building, they don't get halfway and say, oh, well, that's enough. The people are just going to have to get over it because we just can't be bothered anymore. And half a house is, well, it's better than no house. It just doesn't work like that, does it? But for some reason, it often, that's the attitude that happens in church life. So we need to be intentional that God is building his church. That's us. He's building the body of Christ. That's us. He's deliberate in it. He's purposeful in it. He's given resources to aid us and assist us in that. And we are to recognize that we are equally responsible in that business. Fifth, the extent of God's purpose. What's the limitations of what God's trying to do here? And this is the one I love the most. This has been one of my little pet um, themes throughout my entire Christian adult life. It's in verse 13, beginning of, we're to be building up the body of Christ until all reach disagreement in the faith. It doesn't say that, does it? It says until we all reach unity. Now, you notice there the select group within the church he's speaking to? No. There is no select group. It's all of us. The entire church is to recognize that God's vision, God's design, God's plans, God's sovereign work down through the ages is to consistently work for the purposes of building, constructing, engineering, if you like to use that term, to come to unity. Now, let, let's be very clear on this, and I'm not going to labour the point too much. Unity is not agreeing to disagree. Let's get that right clear, bang in the foundation there. Agre unity is not saying, I'll put up with you. I'll tolerate you. Unity is not saying, well, we think differently, and you're just going to have to suck it up because there is no way I'm ever going to think the way you think. That's not unity. If you ask me to use a mechanical term, that's stupidity. Because it's self-defeating. That's why marriages break up, because husband and wives agree to disagree, and then the fighting starts. It leads to devastation in businesses, in school, in any relationships. Unity is as the scriptures would say, like-mindedness. And in the, in the Greek, it conveys oneness. Wow. So, this is, this is not a pretend or partial agreement. This is not toleration or compromise. This is not lip service, but growing intimate relationships between the members of the body of Christ and the Lord himself. You'll notice there that we are to all work striving towards reaching unity in the faith. So there's the framework. Faith defines the perimeters of the unity. It's not personality and it's not preferences that are being defined. You don't have to like the cars I like. You don't have to like the colours I like or the way I dress or whatever. You may or may not like my haircut. That's a, totally irrelevant what God has visioned for the church is that we work together consecutively, perseveringly, until we come to agreement as a working force in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ in all matters pertaining to the Christian faith. Now, 
I want to show you a little bit of deception that's floating around our community at the moment, and by that I mean the Christian community. A little deceptive bit of rhetoric to be aware of, and you'll, some of you will recognise this as soon as I read it. And it's this little statement, it's a little catchphrase that I hear quite often, and it's this. In matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. In all things, love. Now, and I want to read you a brief excerpt from a review by a man by the name of Jack Cottrell of the Restoration Movement. Now, the Restoration Movement, um, we, would, we would be in agreement with much of what they say, but they do go to extremes, which we would be very concerned over. Um, and anyway, the Restoration Movement uses this little catchphrase regularly in their writings. So this is what Jack Cottrell gives a little brief review, and I'm just taking an excerpt. It is well known that this peace saying was coined by a German Lutheran written writer named Peter Meidelin in a work produced about 1627, so 400 odd years ago. Correctly interpreted and understood, it could be valid and useful. But its terms are so ambiguous that, in my opinion, in recent times, it has not been understood or used correctly. First, the common uh, understanding of essentials is essential for salvation, i.e., the only doctrines we need to agree on or seek unity on are those which one must accept in order to be saved. This is usually a short list involving the person and work of Jesus and how to be saved. Second, everything else, all other doctrines are deemed to be non-essentials and all non-essentials are then equated with opinions. Third, since they are not essential for salvation, all opinions, all other doctrines are regarded as unimportant in the sense that it does not make any practical difference what anyone believes about them. It is simply irrelevant what positions anyone takes on these issues. All interpretations and approaches must be respected. The ultimate result of this way of using the slogan is clear. It has the devastating result of watering down and undermining the very concept of truth. In effect, it destroys the biblical concept of sound doctrine. End quote. Wow. I've lost count of how many times I've heard that little ditto quoted to me over the last few years. But what Jack quotes is, is very true. You see, because we live in a so-called age of such prolific toleration, we come to the conclusion that if we can't agree, why should I have to change my mind on anything? So let's just agree to disagree. Ugh, it turns out there's not much we actually agree on at all. Ugh. Is there something we can agree on? And so they start narrowing it down. It turns out, as we've seen in modern times, even the gospel cannot be agreed on, and so so many churches proactively remove the use of repentance, the use of sin, the use of words like hell, the use of words like faith. All absolutes are removed to accommodate this great cosmic oozing oneness of comfort. And who's left out? God is left out. Please observe with me that in our text today in Ephesians 4 verse 13 that the Apostle Paul is not calling the church to a pretend type of would-be unity to only suit people of our own particular persuasion. Well, sixthly, the progression of unity Again, in verse 13, the second part of verse 13, unity in the knowledge of the Son of God. Once again, it's for all of us, and there's no exceptions. Unity begins with who we are in Christ. Unity can only develop in a surrendered, soft-hearted attitude towards the Son of God. Unity can only build upon the absolutes of the knowledge centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. Unity that God envisions is theologically driven. Authentic, unified practice always flows from truth, beloved. And there is no exceptions to that. Unity that God envisions is theologically driven. Authentic, unified practice 
always flows from truth. So, unity has nothing to do with tolerance of others' beliefs. It has nothing to do with personal or historical preference. It has no time frame in which to do the work of unification. And it is not man-centred, it's not me-centred, and it's not you-centred. It is Christ-centred. And that's why I like the fact that Paul here does not give a time frame. Why? Because we are working towards unity. And I can tell you it's one of the richest experiences in my Christian life has been with brothers and sisters in the Lord who accept the responsibility that we're not going to go to war over things. We're going to work, serve the Lord together and we're going to grow to become more and more like-minded in the Word of God as we pray together, study together and serve faithfully together. Well, what's the result of unity? It's right there at the end of verse 13. Maturity, maturing according to the fullness of Jesus Christ. And once again, that's all of us. Wow. So as we elders, as we think and as we pray for you people, you talk about you, what's in our minds? It's that you would all be mature, strong, resilient in your faith, in your spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be terrible if you as a parent went to order your children, and I know we joke about this sometimes, but, and you say, I've decided that you're going to stop growing today. I like you at this age. I liked my boys when they were two years old. Just out of nappies. Oh, hallelujah. And uh, before the war started, <laughs> they were great. And you say, don't grow anymore. But we don't do that, do we? When I was a kid, one of my friends up the street from us had a rare genetic condition. He got to the age of eight and his body stopped growing. And by the time he was 15, he still looked like an eight-year-old. It's a terrible thing when growth stops. And so our desire, my desire as the pastor of this church is that every single one of you would grow, 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 be more like Christ, be more faithful, be more resilient against the attacks of the devil and the attacks of those who would come against Jesus Christ. Is that you would be more faithful, more resilient in your growing marriages and family relationships and with the relationships with one another. Now, just because some of you got your Bibles there, flick over very quickly to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. I want to just show you something of interest there. Just two verses. Right at the end of Hebrews chapter 5. Slightly different context, but the, the truth is applicable just the same. Verse 13 and 14. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Now we know that. If you forever feed your baby on milk, that kid will stay a baby until it dies of malnutrition. The principle is very simple. Look at verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So we recognise that in God's design in the body of Christ that people come to faith in Christ, obviously new, new babies, new Christians, they, they feed on the simple things of the word of God, the simple truths, but it's not meant to stay that way. They are meant to progress, they are meant to mature, they are meant to want to grow. They should want to look forward to the day when they will be strong, mature Christians able to defend the faith, stand up and be accounted for and to defend biblical truth and to stand at the side of their fellow Christians and to defend the truth of the gospel that they have committed to. That is God's design. That is God's vision for the church. God's vision for the church is not for us to remain perpetually childlike or infantile but that everyone from the youngest child up to the oldest ones should be continuously growing in unity, growing in understanding, feeding on the meatier things of God's word, growing in righteousness, growing in knowledge of the Son of God. You see, until unity is about 
Rather not until, but unity is about the noble truth of the Son of God, that's Jesus Christ, and how that truth is applied and put into humble practice by each and every member of the body of Christ. It is directly proportional to the believer's applied truth of Jesus Christ. Here's a fact. I'm going to be bold enough to say it's indisputable. When Christians fall into fights, and battles and arguing and it gets ugly that tells you they are immature in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ you want evidence of that just find in your Bible the occasion when Jesus fought with his father you won't will you in fact you can never find a time when Father, Son and Holy Spirit ever fought against each other even when the father said, son, I want you to go to the cross of Calvary, the son said it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, etc. And so there is wonderful unity, and that's where we need to realise that disagreement does not have to mean disunity. All that disagreement says is that I love Christ enough and I love you enough to say that we're going to commit to an ongoing process of Growing and understanding and loving and working and serving the Lord together until we are in unification. That's a wonderful thing. That's God's vision for the church. You see, Paul then, he says something really interesting, and we'll just rattle through these as I bring it to an end. At the end of our text there in verses 14 of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 through to 16, I just want you to notice what the result is. What's the result of being a unified church? He says in verse 14, we won't be infantile, we won't be childlike, we'll be biblic- we won't be biblically untaught, we won't be unskilled, we won't be simple-minded, we won't be tossed around by false doctrine. And have you ever noticed how easy it is to be tossed around by false doctrine? You may not buy into it, but you get emotionally thrown about because some people are so assertive and so aggressive at trying to ram false doctrine down your throat that they make you feel like you're an utter failure because you won't go down the broad road that they want to go down. And Paul says quite clearly here that we won't be like that. We won't be tossed around. False teaching, false theology, childlike understanding of Christ. I listened to a, a pastor recently give a, a, a passionate message. And you know I enjoy passionate preaching. And after I listened to this for 15 minutes, I sort of turned off because um, it was all about him. He can be the most passionate man on the planet, but if it's all about him, that's no good to me. And it's no good to you. And it's no good to my wife and my children. I need men and women to feed me and to be passionate about the truth of Jesus Christ because that will build me up. That will make me a better pastor. And if I can be a better pastor, I will better serve you more effectively. It will make me a better husband, a better father, a better employer, etc., etc. You see, when we are growing in unity, it speaks to the truth lovingly mercifully, compassionately. And those are words we, we, we need to sort of hang on to. I haven't put it in writing yet, but it's going to happen soon. One of the characteristics this church needs to have is that we need to be known as a people of mercy. Mercy is not just loving. It's not just compassionate. It's not just kind. It's not just giving things that people don't deserve, merciful people are like God. Merciful people take something out of your resources and you actually, really, implant those resources into someone else's life. And I'd encourage you as you read the New Testament to, and it's in the Old Testament as well, how many times you see God putting mercy into practice when he takes something from his, and this is what Ephesians is all about, and he gives gifts to the church. He gives the church something that they don't naturally possess. And so mercy, we need to be a church of mercy. You see, when we're growing in unity, we recognise the interdependent body design. The whole body joined and held together by every ligament with which it is equipped. Building ourselves up, recognising others' dependency on it. 
And I understand that you are dependent upon my walk with the Lord. But realise, brother and sister, as you leave this place today, I am equally dependent on your walk with the Lord. When you stumble, when you fail to grow, when you fail to strive for unity, when you fail to work faithfully, when you fail to serve with perseverance, I suffer the pain, and so does the person sitting next to you. That's the body dynamic of being mutually interdependent upon yourselves, upon each other, upon one another. And that's why he says right at the end of verse 16, as each one does its own work, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up. You see, my walk with the Lord is like your walk with the Lord. It's depend, being depended upon by somebody else. And so God's design for the church, his vision, his expectation for the church is that we take ownership of that responsibility. We recognize the giftedness that God has given to the churches, the resources it's given, and we focus on this church life as the works of service for Christ, growing in the truths of Christ, growing in the opportunities to feed and to share and to pass those truths and those wonderful things we know about Christ onto others. See, true growing unity is evidence of the working of the Holy Spirit. It's evidence of an unnatural development taking place in people's lives. And so I want to read you a little excerpt out of BBF's character story, which you'll read online, the fuller. BBF is growing as a congregation without pretense or demanding personal expectations. To be a place where Jesus' cross is central, empowering personal change toward Christ-likeness. And by God's grace, we are increasingly a church family where time and space to heal from the pains of life is provided, a church home where relationships are grown without demands to conform to any particular religious, organisational or personal expectations, where selfless love enhances unity and loyalty by applying biblical truths, where questions are welcome and answers are provided. A body of diverse Christians content to be who God made us in Christ while growing towards maturity. A community of gospel-focused people who intentionally share Christ with others because we strongly desire to speak well of the Lord Jesus Christ. A fellowship growing in our ability not to take offence. Why? Because love is patient. And kind. Love does not envy or boast. It, does, it is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. And it's not irritable or resentful. You see, with that said, we choose to be a church of intentional unity. When matters of different understandings arise, it's realised that time is given to work together through whatever issues exist with the goal of agreement in biblical truth and application. So, what's God's vision for the church? What's his design for the church? It's for the church to recognise the gifted men that Jesus Christ has gifted the church with, for the church to allow themselves to be equipped as God's people for works of service. It's for the church to be a body committed to being built up. It's for the church to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. It's for the church to mature according to the fullness of Christ. And it's for the church to be a loving church as Christ is loving. Oh, Father, as we've considered these truths very quickly and very simplistically, we acknowledge that you have designed the church fantastically. You have provided everything that the church needs in order to be what you want it to be. And so, Lord, our re prayer request is very simple. Make your vision our vision. Make your design for this church come into reality with an ever-increasing intensity. And make us, Lord, intentional in fulfilling your design for your church, that you would be honoured, that you would be spoken well of, that you would be praised and worshipped and acknowledged as being the source of all good things through this church ministry and in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.